It's time for another edition of Boy Green Daily. And uh, we go to a guy that's been on both sides of the line ahead of this Jets-Giants game. Without further ado, let's roll the footage. Zoinks? And it is unequivocally the Super Bowl for New York Jet fans. Field Gates, baby. Field Gas Guardians. Let's bring him on the show. Come on, people. Connor Rogers is on the show. What's up, Connor? But Trevor Gas Guard Sikama, baby. For me, personally, my favorite New York Jet of all time. Wow, it's great to be on. What an intro that was right there. Paul, you, nobody does an intro like you, man. Paul, you, you give the best intro of literally any podcast that I've, I've, I've ever seen. I'm going to lose my gas darn bananas. Oh, oh, yeah, baby. Paul Ashton Jr. here, a.k.a. Boy Green. Welcome to Boy Green Daily, a daily New York Jets video program. And we got a spectacular guest, a 10-year NFL veteran, an Emmy award-winning sports analyst for Pete's sake, Leger Gosh Darn Deucible. And we all know him by Deuce. Let's bring him in the building, baby. What's up, Leger? Paul, man, nobody does an intro like you, man. I appreciate you having me on again. Well, uh, Leger, let's get right into it. We'll start off here on the top uh, that you have played on both sides. You've been a member of the New York Jets. You've been a member of the New York Jets. We have this game coming up. And I guess just to start off straight up, does, is this a rivalry? Does this game have a little extra juice when it comes up? It's only once every four years. So I've heard people argue both sides. I'm curious what you think see, since literally you've been on both sides. <laughs> Yeah, it's a bit of a rivalry. And yes, Paul, you're correct that every four years the game means something because it's played in the regular season. But let's not forget, there's a battle of MetLife every single year in the preseason. Right now, yeah. things have changed over the time. When I was playing, that was always the third preseason game. So that was our dress rehearsal game. So that was the game that meant the most in preseason. That was like us trying to get ready for the regular season. So there was always an uptick in aggression, speed, and everything in that game because – that was, again, our dress rehearsal for the regular season. So I think, obviously, it means something, right? You always want those bragging rights in the city of New York. And I, I'm not sure if they still do this, but when I played, I believe, um, I'm trying to think of the, the actual building, um, they actually changed the colors to whoever wins that, that Ooh, day. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, again, I don't know why I'm having a brain fart and forgot what. Is that what, the building. Empire State Building? Is that what it was. About? Oh, there it is, yeah, yeah, the okay. Empire State yeah. Building. Yeah, they always changed it to whoever won. After, you know, that preseason game, it would, uh, you know, and I wonder if they're going to do it for the regular season game. So, I mean, you talk about a Giants team that's coming off a big win, divisional win over the Commanders. Jets coming off a bye week, but had two big wins. So both of these teams are looking to try to start a little streak, right, and help, help propel them to aspirations of making a run in the playoffs. So this is a big game, a lot riding on this game, uh, a lot of uncertainty in this game on the injury injury. Uh, front because again we don't know who's going to start a quarterback for the Giants there's some injuries for the Jets we'll know more Wednesday when the injury reports come out yeah there's uh, no doubt about it and uh, I'm curious because uh, on one side you mentioned the bragging rights I mean the Jets have been beaten by the Giants since 2011 so Jets are like yeah baby of course that was also the year the Giants won the Super Bowl and they won a couple of those over Tom Brady so I guess they have those sort of bragging rights so uh, that goes a little I guess uh, back and forth you mentioned the quarterback uncertainty because we don't know Tyrod Taylor has been the guy uh, for the last two games for the Giants but they paid Dan O'Jones 140 million dollars so you imagine when he's healthy he's going to be good to go from a Jets perspective which quarterback would you rather face because the offense has had a little spark with Tyrod but, I mean, spark is somewhat relative. They've scored 14 and 9 points over the last two weeks. So, a spark, because the, it doesn't say much about what they were doing before that point. Yeah, it's interesting, right? Because uh, if you look at both of them, both are very mobile quarterbacks. Both can hurt you with their legs. Uh, Daniel Jones played really well last year, right? They've struggled this year. I think the thing that hasn't been talked about enough, besides the Jets, I, I believe the Giants have probably had the hardest schedule coming out the gate as well. So, They've had a gauntlet to start the season, right? Games versus Buffalo, games versus the Miami Dolphins. So they, they've had a, a really strong schedule coming out. So, I mean, if you look at it, I don't know if you lean towards one quarterback or another. Um, maybe you want Daniel Jones playing because he hasn't played in a few weeks. And like you said, Tyrod Taylor has gotten the offense kind of going, but 
that's relative, like you said, because at the end of the day, they scored, what, 14 to 9 points. So uh, they haven't put up a ton of points, but the offense does seem like it has clicked a little bit more, right? Darren Waller, they're high price you know, not free agency, free agent because they traded for him, but the high price weapon on offense, he's really gotten going the last two weeks with Tyrod Taylor. They've they've really made an emphasis on really featuring him in the offense, right? And we saw Saquon Barkley back for the first time last week. Didn't have crazy rush numbers, um, but had a few explosive runs, had a few, you know, explosive catches out of the backfield. Uh, Wondell Robinson is a guy that I think is going to play a major role. He's a guy, him, you know, versus Michael Carter, I think is, something that should be an X factor matchup this week, right? Rondell Robinson, uh, when he gets the ball on the slide, he has the potential to take every catch, you know, 15 to 20 yards because of the speed that he has, right? He's not only quick, he has that long speed as well. So that'll be interesting, you know, matchup, Paul, this week, Michael Carter, the second versus Rondell Robinson in that slot. It's a good highlight. I, I mean, on paper, the Giants have a bunch of guys at wide receiver, but uh, no one that really stands out, Darius Slayton and Isaiah Hodgins and this, but Wanda Robinson is the interesting one because he's a lottery yeah. ticket of sorts, a, a highly thought of draft pick that hasn't gotten his chance in the sun with injuries last year, but he is a super talented guy. I know Jalen Hyatt's another one. So you got a lot of guys, but Wanda Robinson could be that one, maybe a mystery package of sorts that if we're able to get him some ops, that could maybe be where the Giants could get uh, some of those chunk plays and opportunities. So uh, that's a good highlight point. That's a very good highlight point there. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah I, again, I, if you just watched the game last week, right, I think Brian Dable is masterful on how he puts in different personnel groups to attack you, right? If he wants to throw the ball down the field, he's going to go 12 personnel, one back, two tight ends. That way you have to keep an extra linebacker. And that's where we saw Darren Waller really make hate versus the Washington Commanders. Jamin Davis was struggling in the pass coverage, and Tyrod Taylor exploited that, right? And then on the backside – Anytime you go two by one or three by one, um, the Giants, if they have Jalen Hyatt in the boundary, they're throwing a goal ball to him. Like, I, I believe he had like six targets on goal balls and they were all into the boundary. So your, your ears have to perk up if you're that boundary corner and Jalen Hyatt's out there. They're going to throw the ball. Tyrod's going to look the safety off and he's going to throw the goal ball just to give their speedster an opportunity. So, yeah, I think Brian Dayball is fine. I want to say finally um, catching his stride this year. But he's done a really good job. Uh, you know, there's been some talks whether it's Kafka calling the plays or Brian Dayball calling the plays. We don't actually truly know. I think it's been a combination of the two. Uh, but the combination of the two have done really well with Ty uh, Tyrod the last two weeks. And, again, you got to put that into perspective because they still haven't filled up the scoreboard. But the offenses look better, which in turn has helped the defense and that defensive line be able to get after quarterbacks. Yeah, I feel pretty good about that second level of the Jets defense. It's been a while. For a while, the Jets had, of course, David Hitman Harris. He was there uh, for a long time. Then there was a gap of time as they were trying to figure out who is that next guy. They bring in C.J. Mosley, obviously, and he had a few years of both the injuries, the COVID opt-out. We weren't really sure. And then he's taken, he, of course, has been tremendous. He was an all-pro last year. And Quincy Williams has taken this dramatic step. So you got to feel phenomenal, quite frankly, about that linebacker, though, that may be one of the best in football, according to a lot of the numbers you look at. Yeah, it is one of the best. I would say they're a top three group. Uh, C.J. Mosley seems like the last two years is finally getting the respect due to him. And, Paul, Quincy Williams is playing out of this world. Like, I just saw something about, his potential projections if he were to stay on the <laughs> yeah. same course six sacks 170 tackles i think like 15 tackles for loss which is astronomical like he hasn't been talked about enough right he's not playing pro bowl football he's playing all pro football and the thing that he's really taking the next step is in between the ears right and you could you could probably liken that to all brick his linebacker coach but also cj mosley you could tell he's been in his hip pocket the last three years just you know, soaking up that information like a sponge. And then his, we knew he was a freak athlete, right? We knew sideline to sideline speed. We knew he was a physical guy in the run game, but his coverage skills this year. I mean, there's been times he's been manned up on receivers, manned up on tight ends, on wheel routes, 40, 50 yards down the field. And he's been in their hip pocket. And that's going to be big today. I mean, not today, but on Sunday, especially because of what I talked about earlier, the way Brian Dayball likes to implore some of that 12 personnel, take some shots down the field. There could be opportunities where he is manned up with Darren Waller, right? And his skill set with the speed he has, right, the athletic ability he has, it'll be big for him to be able to lock down Darren Waller in those those situations when he is one-on-one -on -one or in zone coverage where he has to hug Darren Waller. So 
again, Quincy has played out of this world this year. He's been the, the best player on the Jets team, not offense, defense on the team this year. And that's not crazy to say. He has an 87.1 coverage grade from PFF, the best coverage linebacker in football. Yeah. Stunning. And maybe this is a moot point, but I'm kind of interested in your take here, Leger, is that is it Quincy? Does he deserve the credit? Is it C.J. Mosley being uh, the master to the student? Is that potential? <laughs> Jeff Volberg, Robert Sala, who took a chance on this young man, he gets cut from Jacksonville. He's a raw player, but they're able to hone all that. Is a little bit of everything. Who really deserves credit for this unbelievable development project that the Jets uh, have been able to boast, obviously, this season? I think it's a little bit of everything, right? Having a all-pro guy next to you for three years, you would hope some of that rubs off on you. And I think Quincy has come out and said that, right, what C.J. Mosley means to him. Like, he literally, when he was here in 2021, he followed him and did everything he did, right? And we, we're trying to, we're starting to see the fruits of that labor in 2023. But you also have to give a kudos to Quincy, right? Because you can do all the studying you want, but you have to apply that on the field. It's one thing to learn it in the classroom, but it's another thing to go out there and physically do it. So you have to give a kudos to him. You got to give a kudos to, to you know, uh, Coach Albrick, uh, the linebacker coach. Like they've all had a hand in, in Quincy Williams' development. But at the end of the day, it was on Quincy to go out there and make it happen. And that's exactly what he's doing this year. I'm hoping that strategy is effective because, Lashay, I bring you on the show. You're an Emmy award winning sports nurse. I'm hoping some of that by osmosis of some sort flowing in the atmosphere, I, I can kind of absorb. I'm going to be honest, selfishly, that's the sole reason I brought you on the show. Absolutely. That's I'm funny. not sure if it's working, <laughs> but uh, yes. It's yes. definitely working, man. I can see it, Paul. You're you on deck, man. Trust me, you're on deck. Uh, I appreciate that. Let's uh, get into your uh, craft of choice as a former defensive lineman. Uh, uh, there's a lot of interesting ones on the Jets roster. We'll start with their first round pick. Will McDonald has not gotten a lot of PT. Uh, I was at the Dallas game and seeing, seeing him as a healthy scratch almost pulled what little hair I have left in my head out. I just don't <laughs> understand any rational explanation where you would, uh, you know, you have such a luxury where you would be able to make a guy a healthy scratch. So what have you seen on tape in the limited opportunities with Will McDonald? Because in training camp preseason, we saw some pops where we're like, oh, in a limited role perhaps to go, there could be something here. Yeah, and I think it's it's the same tra uh, trajectory Jermaine Johnson went through last year. Like, the Jets de defensive line is one of the deepest defensive line in football. Let's not forget – they paid Jacob Martin and then traded him halfway through the season because that D-line was that deep. And, yes, Will McDonald was a luxury pick, but if you look at it, right, at the end of the season, Bryce Huff, who they better not let out the door, is a free mm -hmm. agent, right? Uh, Carl Lawson, it seems like he might be getting traded soon. Um, mm -hmm. They restructured his deal, but he most likely was going to be, you know, somewhere else next year anyway. So that's two guys potentially that could be gone. Again, Huff, I think you can't let him walk out the door. Uh, there's no way. So I think it's going to be like a, a Jermaine Johnson trajectory where, you know, his first year, um, Will McDonald's going to get probably seven to ten snaps a game, right? Especially the, with the, the the emergence of Jermaine Johnson and how he's played. He's played out of this world. And I told everybody he would going into his second mm. year. Uh, he just needed more opportunities to get more comfortable in this defense. And we've seen him really – essentially the Philadelphia Eagle game, he took over in that game. So – we look at him, you look at Bryce Huff, you know, hopefully being signed back. A guy that nobody's talking about who is the unheralded star of this defense, John Franklin Myers, right? You still have Michael Clemens playing. Like, this is a deep edge group. Like, so they have a lot of guys. So it's, 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 you would think, you know, a guy that goes to the, what, 15 overall, he's going to find his way on the field. But it's like, who do you take off the field, right? Like, you can't just, question. Yeah. you can't take, you know, Bryce Huff off. You can't take Jermaine off. You can't take JFM off. So it's like, Will McDonald has surely gotten more reps, right? Um, he's been getting, I think, like nine to ten reps a game. He'll have a third down role as he gets more comfortable in this this uh, defense. And I think next offseason, as he gets bigger, really fills out his body, you'll see, you know, like I said, a trajectory like Jermaine, where he's probably playing 30 to 35 percent of the snaps instead of just taking eight or nine snaps. You'll see him take 15 to 20 snaps a game. So um, it's just, you know, the Jets defense line is really deep. Uh uh, I don't think they knew that Jermaine was going to take off like he did. I did, you know. Of course uh, you did. Lawson. Talk your chocolate, Jay Deutschable. Carl, For Pete's Carl sake. Lawson, Carl hmm. Lawson was coming off an Achilles and still had seven, seven and a half sacks last year. Yeah. So you can't let that guy walk out the door. Um, but now it's just to a point where right now Jermaine's playing at a higher level and Bryce Huff is too. So it's hard for Carl to get on the field. That's why he's been, 
you know, talked about in trade rumors, you know, I've actually put out there um, a scenario where it makes a lot of sense for, you know, the Raiders and the Jets to do business. Mm. Hunter Renfro is a guy that they haven't really used. Jacoby Myers signed there this offseason. They like to use him in the slot. I think that's what the Jets are missing right now, a dependable slot receiver. I think Hunter Renfro, a lot of people will say he's washed, but he's not washed. He's just not getting used <laughs> with the Raiders. So uh, I think it makes a lot of sense if the logistics work out to trade, you know, you know, Carl Lawson for Hunter Renfro. I don't know what that looks like. Does somebody get a sixth round pick or a sixth or seventh round swap in that deal? Um, I think it makes a lot of sense for both teams to do business. Yeah, it makes sense both from your perspective that you're talking about from a need perspective. Uh, I had Mo Moten of Bleach Report on the show. He said, we need another pass rusher up with Max Crosby. So that's a need. And obviously, to the yeah. Jets' point, they've been trotting out, you know, nothing. I'm not trying to be an agent here, but old man Randall Cobb. I mean, for Pete's sake, there's got to be some reps for somebody else out there. And to your point, maybe that is the perfect balance of two needs. And also contractually, they actually match up very well from that perspective as well. So that could uh, certainly make a lot of sense. Quick nugget on Will McDonald, because you've been talking about some the reps he's been getting nine ten reps a game Lachey, how difficult is that for a guy in college who who's the dude at iowa state getting all kinds of reps and so you could almost be a volume shooter and work your way through any potential slumps now i said hey pal you're getting nine to ten reps and cold turkey off the bench we just want you to give us the same thing you were doing with the 40 50 snaps you're getting in college but like your best every time that sounds you know easier said than done yeah, because football is a rhythm game, right? You want to get into the rhythm of the game. But if you look at the history, Bryce Huff had to do it. That's Jermaine true. Johnson had to do it. Mm -hmm. This is the game of the NFL. Like they always say, like you have to take full advantage of your opportunities when you get them because they come few and far in between. And that's what Moe McDonald just has to do, right? He's not going anywhere. He's a first round pick. He's going to be here for the next four years minimum, right? So like just take advantage of your opportunities. You'll get more as the years go on. But right now, it's all about having a set role as a situational pass rusher and doing that at an elite level. Say we need you, you know, two reps in the first quarter, three reps in the second quarter. Like those have to be, like you said, on fire reps, everything you got. Right. Because, you know, you're only getting few and far in between. So you have mm -hmm. to let it go. You got to let it fly when you get in there. Um, so I, I know it's difficult because I've been in that situation before because it's hard to come into the game cold turkey, not knowing the rhythm of the game. And as a pass rusher, you set up moves so that one time you can beat somebody for a sack. So it's kind of hard to do that when you're only getting eight to nine reps. But this is the NFL, man. You got to be able to find your role, find your niche. And once you get that opportunity, you got to go out there and make plays. I loved it because your boy Jermaine is, uh, again, your El Presidente of the Jermaine Johnson <laughs> fan club. I, I loved he was talking about after one of the games, he was selling the offensive tackle every time on an inside move. And he said, but in the, in the back of his head, he's like, oh, I'm going to get this bastard in the fourth quarter. I'm just going in, in, in. And then he said he came out and then just whoop right on the offensive tackle. So it's crazy. And you guys are thinking about that during a game, just setting him up, setting him up, and then hit him with a crossover. Hey, now. And then the whole body falls down. A jack strap aisle three i mean that's phenomenal and that's exactly what we saw at jermaine in that eagles game it may be i know it doesn't show up on the box where of like you know 20 sacks or some crazy number but the deflections the impact on the game jermaine johnson man all the love and everything you've been bestowing on him that jig and dance you did at sny tv when uh, <laughs> they they listened of course to leger gaston Ducible, draft insider draft expert bringing jermaine johnson in and he's been delivered on that praise man uh, victory parade you've you been doing any of that you, you <laughs> signing some babies get some, some autographs on jermaine johnson yeah i told you guys no prediction spoiler alerts baby I mean, I tried to tell people all offseason. I mean, I just saw how he was working. I was talking to him in the offseason. He, he was just in a better headspace going into this season, knowing that he was going to have an opportunity. And honestly, if Carl Lawson doesn't get hurt, who knows if he has the opportunity he has. Now, will he have gotten more reps? Obviously, right? But would he have been a solidified starter? And I think um, it's safe to say he is a solidified starter on this team right now. Honestly, thought. He should have been up for AFC Defensive Player of the Week versus the, uh, the Philadelphia Eagles for how he played. Like you said, a lot of that stuff doesn't show up in the stat board, but it kind of does with him, right? A PBU that goes into an interception. Right. You get a quarterback hit that turns into an interception, and then you get a sack uh, you know, by yourself in that game as well. So, uh, again, uh, I think this kid is locked in this, this year, and I think he said it best, right? This team plays for each other, right? There's a lot of times where t guys are going out there. You want the individual accolades. But if you have team success, and I try to tell, you know, even when I was playing, I try to tell dudes this. If we have team success, 
other teams want to pluck guys off of that because they want to bring that into the locker room, right? So mm-hmm. if we have team success, we're all going to get individual success, right? So like sometimes it might not be your time to make a play. Sometimes it might not be your time to make a sack. Sometimes you got to take on a double team so somebody can get the one-on-one. You just have to live in that realm where if we all eat, we going to be fine, right? We all going to get paid. We all going to continue to stack these wins. And at the end of the day, everybody wants to be on a winning team right now. Again, there are individual accolades. You got to pay your bills, right? And sure. in these contracts, there's always these uh, incentive based contracts where you got to hit certain things to get paid. We all get that. Right. But at the end of the day, if you're on a winning team, right. And you have some success, even if you don't put up the gaudy numbers, Somebody from another team is going to want to bring that into their fold, into that locker room, because this guy knows how to do it the right way. You know, he thought about the team. He also went out there and produced. Let's try to bring that into our locker room and turn things around. So you got to look at it that way. A couple of quickies before we get you out of here, Leger. I'm Bryce Huff, okay? I want you to represent Bryce Huff here, and I'm going to ask you a two-part question. First off. (laughs) as he is scheduled to be an unrestricted free agent in 2024, is there any number, I guess there is, but within reason, is there any number the Jets could slap on the table and slide over to him that he would be willing to sign midseason? Or is there no number? And he's like, hey, I'm going to keep balling out and I'm going to be an unrestricted free agent or franchise tag or whichever would happen. And then we'll see what my value is. We know they pay people that sack the quarterback. Out of those, you know, what do you think is the right thing there? Can the Jets, uh, Jet fans are screaming for them to, you know, sign Bryce Huff. But would he yeah. even sign saying, I'm making a lot of money the more that I continue to not sign because the, the tape is speaking for itself. Yeah, and, and that's the, the gamble as players that you roll out, right? If you're having a, you would say, a contract type year and you're actually having a I don't want to say Pro Bowl year because he doesn't have like the Gotti Sag numbers, but he is leading the league like in pressure rate. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the dice you roll, right? Because you're trying to figure out if I keep continue to do this, then there's going to be a bevy of teams wanting me. But then there's also that financial security that you get right now if the team were to offer you a deal. So, I mean, that's where you get. You have to trust the people that you work with. You got to trust your team. You got to trust your gut. Um, is this where I want to be? Um, if we get to a certain number where I'm comfortable with, am I going to be comfortable going forward? Right. I mean, I, don't know, I have seen some asterisk num- asterisk asterisk numbers out there as far as yeah. what he could potentially make. I don't know how true some of those are. I know okay. I saw a number upwards to 23 million a year and I'm like, yeah, I know defensive linemen are getting paid like 30. But if you think about it, a lot of those dudes that were getting that, right. I, I think Quentin Williams, edge guys always get paid more, but I think Quentin Williams is like around 25, yeah, yep. I think he had 12 and a half sacks, though. Like, That's so if true. Bryce Huff gets 12 and a half sacks, yeah, of course he's he's probably going to get that in the open market. But a guy that I kind of look at, Obi, Obi Okoronkro, who was with yes. the Houston Texans that okay. went to the, the Cleveland Browns, I think he's making around 8 to 10 mil. I think if the Jets offered something like that, I think Bryce uh, Huff would, would it'd be a hard pass not to sign up on something like that, like a three-year deal worth like 24 or, or $27 million or, or three or $30 million um, just because the salary cap continues to skyrocket. I think he'd be hard pressed to maybe not sign that, especially coming as an undrafted free agent, getting that financial security. And then if you look at it, if it's a three-year deal, he can go back to the table after two more years. Of so it's, uh, so uh, I, I think that's the realm where he's at right now. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense for the Jets to do it, just like they locked JFM up in the 21 season during the bye. I thought that they could potentially do that for Bryce Huff. I just think that with the so much so much unknown with Aaron Rodgers and depending on what's going to happen next year, I think Joe D looked at that and was like, ah, it's hard for us to make a deal. But that's why you, you get paid the big bucks, right? You got to make those type of decisions. I would have tried to lock him up um, no matter what if Woody was cool with it because if you just look what this, this dude did, like the, the Buffalo game, he single-handedly turned that game around. I mean – the Philadelphia Eagles game, he was unblockable. Like, mm-hmm. this dude, time and time. Even the Dallas game, like, I know a lot of people were saying the D-line wasn't getting pressure. But if you go back and watch that game, Dak Prescott was masterful in getting the ball in his hand because if he didn't, Bryce Huff was on him. Like, it was – it like, if you go back and watch mm-hmm. that tape, Bryce Huff was on his head. So, um, as far as, like, getting – creating pressure and, and causing penalties, like, Bryce Huff has been second to none this year in the league. Uh, like, again, doesn't have the, the, the numbers, but the quarterbacks are throwing the ball so quick. It's hard to really get those sacks. So 
Um, I would, I would, if I was the Jets, I definitely would have looked at it during the bye week. I mean, they still have up until you know the game on Sunday, sure, yeah, potentially get something done, but they may just be locked into the season. But like, like I said, with so much unknown going into next year, uh, they might just revisit that at the end of the season. But that could be the sweet point you're talking about. Bryce Huff is 25 years of age again, that middle three year deal, give him a little juiced up. That might be a little bit more realistic. I saw that too. It's like 23 million dollars. Good lord, there's not a lot of dudes making that, man. Yeah, that's (laughs) uh, that's, that's I mean, Yannick and Gog, yeah, Yannick and Gogway, I think, is 28. He's coming off, uh, I think, a 10 sack season or nine, and he got 10. So I'm like. So well, uh, yeah, Bryce is young. when you're younger, you get a little bit more because that, I guess it's, that's it's true. projection. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That certainly makes sense. All right, Leger, before we get you out of here, I have a what's more likely for you as a final one that the Jets get their first blowout win of the season against the Giants on Sunday, no. or <laughs> it's this nasty defensive slugfest with the over under, which by the way, you know, grab your barf bag, 36 and a half. Ugh, disgusting. <laughs> so that is, that is the current number. So again, yeah. what's more likely? Jets uh, blow out the Giants, or we get that nasty slugfest, and we'll kind of see what happens with uh, maybe a turnover deciding the game. I mean, this game's always been a slugfest. I remember we played them yeah. in 2015. We were down 10 3, and we scored, scored seven and, and tied it up. And then we end up scoring at the end to win the game in a really one score close game. So mm-hmm. I think going into that game, we were supposed to blow them out that game too, and it didn't happen. So um, this game is always going to be tight. You know, inner city rivalry. Um, I always like in this, and I, I tell people, like, when you play for the New York Giants, it's kind of like playing for Duke. When you play for the Jets, it's like you're on the Fab Five, right? <laughs> uh, so uh, that's the type of rivalry it is. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think there's a lot of hate and disdain for the sure. uh, Giants. Uh, one, because it's two totally different uh, conferences. So they're not even in the same right. conference. Um, and like I said, we played them every preseason game, but this is going to be a close game. I know a lot of people were saying the blow. I'm like, no, first of all, the Jets are coming off the bye. Uh, teams mm-hmm. always tend to start a little bit slower when when they come off the bye in the first half. So I think it's going to be a drag out close game. Um, I think the Jets do get it done right, but uh, it, it would be great for the the defense to start fast this game because even though the defense has played well in spurts, right, and, and they're not playing up to the standard they played last year as far as yardage per game. The one yep. thing that's changed is the turnovers, right? Last year for we sure. were getting the turnovers, we're giving up a little bit more yardage this year, but we're having those game changing turnovers. Um, they've struggled coming out the gate, right? Like teams yes. have been able to score on them on the first drive. Uh, you would like for the defense to come out, you know, really fast versus New York Giants offense and, and kind of let them know what type of game it's going to be all day long. Well, uh, looking for it whatever way. Hey, man, a, a win is a win. If we get that for nasty sure. slug or the blood, you know, uh, I don't discriminate. Anyone is good for me. <laughs> Up, down, left or right, I'll take it, baby. That would be uh, spectacular. Well, LeJay, thanks for popping back on the show. It's been a hot second, and uh, I can feel the power of your Emmy Award. I'm kind of like warming up the hands over to it. <laughs> if I, I'm getting any energy there. You, you need a Let couple more. Through, you got some room on the Let show. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, thank you very much. And there's some more space over there. We may need to slap a couple more on there Lejay. i think uh, that's the think plan that's in the man. future that's baby the yes yeah all right beautiful well Lejay, thanks for taking the time brother and uh we'll be checking back in with you soon i'm sure appreciate it paul there he is Lejay, gosh darn doosable everybody thanks for